Hi there. Today we are joined by Dr. David Sistrom, who is the newest co-director of the Ronald G. Tompkins MECFS collaboration at Harvard Affiliated Hospitals. So just to start off, um, I would love to hear more about what brought you to the field of MECFS research specifically and how you got started. Sure. So um, with full disclosure, I am a uh, lung doctor. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician, and I've had a special interest in exercise physiology for my entire career. Um, many, many years ago, we developed um, specialized exercise tests called the invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, uh, which was originally designed to detect early uh, heart disease, early pulmonary vascular disease, to differentiate between heart and lung disease as a cause for exercise um, uh, problems and uh, cases where the clinician hadn't been able to figure it out fully with tests done for the patient at rest. And we found this test very useful, but over time, slowly but surely, uh, we came to realize that there was a subset of patients whose exertional intolerance was not explained by any classic heart or lung disease or a combination of the two. And we began looking for other reasons. And lo and behold, with a fair amount of serendipity, probably six to seven years ago, uh, we began to systematically study these other patients and determined that many, if not all of them, met clinical criteria for MECFS. Wow. So when you first started to see that, were you aware of chronic fatigue syndrome at that point, or was it something that was lesser known in the medical community at that time? Oh, definitely the latter. Um, yes, aware. Um, also probably aware at the time of some of the controversies about case definitions. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of them had been uh, put through the ringer with experts, and uh, there wasn't a real consensus at the time, nor is there totally to this day, although things I think have gotten better, um, about w what the disease was, whether there were subsets of patients with different types of uh, problems that we could identify and maybe treat differently in the end. So none of, none of that was readily apparent six to seven years ago. Uh, and then I was very much aware that there was a, a large um, population of medical care providers who flat out didn't believe there was such a thing as MECFS, uh, and uh, we'll call them the naysayers for the moment. And um, and in part that was understandable, and that uh, when we used all the time honored things at our disposal, history, physical exam, routine labs, cardiac echo, cardiac stress test, pulmonary function test, test imaging. Uh, most often in these cases, they're all negative. And, they, and that led to frustration both on the part of the healthcare providers investigating this disorder or these disorders and the patients, of course, as well. So I was aware of the controversy way back uh, in the day, but have since become even more aware. That's so important because I think there is still, unfortunately, a gap in that understanding. So I assume when these patients came to you, many of them actually weren't diagnosed at all yet with MECFS. That's correct. Okay. So that must have been because MECFS is still widely a diagnosis, a diagnosis of exclusion. So I'm sure that was difficult for them as well, just not having the proper answers, but everything, of course, coming back negative. So very difficult in the exactly. diagnostic process, but as a exactly. newest, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, it, and I think that's still, unfortunately, to this day, still something that many patients go through. Um, and I know uh, there is a statistic that says some an average patient may take up to five years for a diagnosis. Uh, all, all true, and then the diagnosis often, most often, still is sort of a clinical one. It's um, you know, it's a framework to start with, but until we started, we and others started taking a deep dive into uh, the pathophysiology and, and increasingly the um, omics, um, you know, plasma samples and whole blood samples. Um, you know, 
until we started doing that, we really just were left with a kind of a clinical framework uh, to start with, but it, it wasn't very satisfying in that it, yes, described the patient, but didn't lead to specific therapies or clinical trials that could be helpful for the patient. Right. So that is such a huge gap. And I think that's something we're trying to fill at our collaborative centers at the Open Medicine Foundation supported centers. So as a newest co-director of the Harvard collaboration alongside Dr. Wenzong Zhao, uh, in what direction would you like to take the center in the better understanding and discovering of new treatments for ME-CFS and also long COVID and of course the related multi-system chronic complex diseases? Right. So uh, great question. Well, I think um, our mandate, and this has been put into overdrive with the advent of PASC or long COVID, uh, with so many patients calling their Congress people and uh, asking for um, a systematic response in terms of NIH funding and um, and uh, related diagnostics and therapeutics. So uh, where I would love this to go rapidly is the development of uh, hard endpoints uh, that diagnose the disease where we can say as a group, okay, you have X, we have demonstrated uh, these abnormalities, you can't make them up. These abnormalities are not in your head. Uh, and believe me, we get, a, when we do tell our patients this, we get uh, appropriately emotional responses because many of them have been written off for so long. Um, and the, um, so we want hard endpoints, um, uh, physiology, uh, and omics, uh, and to a degree, I think imaging, especially central nervous system, uh, imaging, PET scans, MRIs, et cetera. Um, all of these things are hard endpoints and, uh, they can tell us that, uh, patient X has not made this up, that patient X is not simply detrained or out of shape, that the answer is going to not going to be simply sending them off to the gym and telling them to work their way through it. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be one, better diagnostics and hard endpoints. And the other one, I think, and of course, there's a congressional mandate with the Recover uh, Project uh, in long COVID that I hope will uh, in uh, in a way, be transferred over to the, quote, old-fashioned MECFS is clinical trials. So there's been a dearth of clinical trials in both diseases. Um, I think as we learn more about uh, the diseases, and they may in fact be very similar or even to a degree identical, uh, long COVID and ME, um, then I think we can be more intelligent about uh, doing proper clinical trials, randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials with um, a real physiologic basis. So, uh, and again, hard endpoints as a result of those clinical trials. So not only do we have a better uh, diagnosis, or we hope to have a better diagnosis at play, uh, we hope to use uh, the diagnostic endpoints in clinical trials um, to determine uh, whether drug X works or not. And these could be brand new drugs or they could be uh, repurposed drugs, which is really a fascinating area. Um, you know, FDA approved drugs with, um, to a degree, again, serendipity um, applied uh, in, a, in an educated fashion to address both ME and PASC. Absolutely. I think that's that has a lot of promise, especially with repurposed drugs, if we can be able to find something that may work for MECFS or long COVID patients, because as we know, uh, new, new drug developments is always a very lengthy process. So it would always be a little bit easier, perhaps, if we could expedite it with the usage of drugs that already exist for these patients. Exactly. And so to speak a little bit more on clinical trials, so you and your group at Brigham and Women's Hospital have actually evaluate, evaluated more than 1,500 patients by performing something called an upright invasive IC PET. 
to investigate this exertional intolerance or post-exertional malaise PEM. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just explain a little bit about what you learned specifically using this ICPET testing method and why it's important for researching these diseases specifically. Sure. So the invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, as the name implies, um, is a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which I should define. Uh, a lot of places do the non-invasive variety. Uh, it's um, some sort of workload imposed, usually on a cycle ergometer with an incremental uh, protocol that takes up to their maximum uh, capacity, although there are many variations of, of um, workload imposed. Some centers use treadmills, uh, and there are some data on sub-maximum protocols. But for the most part, I think the most information is gleaned uh, with an incremental protocol where the patient has taken up over five, six, seven, eight minutes to their symptom-limited maximum. And then along the way, the non-invasive part is involves the mouthpiece in the mouth, nose clip, EKG leads, and a pulse oximeter. Uh, and the mouthpiece is connected to a metabolic card. Um, and that metabolic card uh, derives uh, things like the oxygen uptake at the mouth and the carbon dioxide output at the mouth and measurements of minute ventilation. So from those three variables, a fair amount of information can be gleaned about any patient with heart lung disease or uh, uh, ME or FAST. Um, you can determine um, how uh, impaired the patient is from the time-honored VO2 max, that's the maximum oxygen uptake at the end of the exercise. So uh, we express that as a percent predicted. The predicted values for VO2 max are derived from the patient's age, and gender, and an estimate of lean muscle mass, which in turn is derived from the height. Um, so a fair amount of information can be gleaned from that. We can say the patient is 50% of normal, or more often in ME and FAST, it will be around 70, 70%, 75% are predicted. And I would hasten to add that one should not stop there on a symptomatic patient. Uh, one should not do a non-invasive test to determine that their VO2 peak or maximum is in the slightly depressed range and simply decide this is detraining because there's a lot more to be unearthed if uh, one keeps digging. Um, and one other comment on the non-invasive test is that uh, more often than not, and especially seemingly in long COVID, there is some evidence of hyperventilation. Uh, it's not directly measured with a non-invasive test, but there are a couple of measures, including something called ventilatory inefficiency, minute ventilation divided by the CO2 output and expressed as a fraction or slope during the exercise. So when that's high, it's compatible uh, most often in these diseases with hyperventilation, and that's known to be um, a feature of a, at least a subset of patients with ME and um, very commonly seen in long COVID. Uh, the other is an end tidal CO2 and its response to exercise. When those numbers are low at rest and even lower yet with exercise, that's another hint that the patient is hyperventilating. And again, this does not mean it's all in the head. It's a poorly understood phenomenon, but it's ubiquitous and uh, certainly in past That's the non-invasive test. It's useful. It's very useful to start with. But again, if there are mild abnormalities, uh, please don't write the patient off as having nothing wrong with them. So the invasive portion is where we've uh, gleaned most of the insights into the pathophysiology of exercise and tolerance in both ME and long COVID. And that uh, adds to the non-invasive test two catheters that are placed in our cardiac cath lab before the test. Uh, one is a radial artery catheter, and the other is a pulmonary artery catheter placed with the help of ultrasound and fluoroscopy uh, in the cath lab uh, through the internal jugular vein. So those two catheters are placed, uh, and at our institution, the patient is pulled around the corner into the exercise lab and uh, then up on the bike and everything properly set up, and they pedal away for 
again, five to perhaps eight minutes, and we get a phenomenal amount of information. So the uh, ad additional information that we get from the catheters combined with the non-invasive test is measurements of uh, blood vessel or vascular pressure, uh, that's systemic blood pressure, and that's pulmonary artery pressures and pulmonary venous pressures, and then importantly, the filling pressures uh, for both the left and the right heart, the right atrial pressure and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Um, turns out that that has been a phenomenally revealing area. Filling pressures are quite low uh, and uh, almost universally low uh, in the 1,500 patients that you mentioned that we studied with ME and then more recently long COVID. Um, then there's uh, one other uh, category of measurements made with the catheters, and the big one is the sick cardiac output, that's F-I-C-K. Dr. Sick got put this on the map 100 years ago. If one measures the VO2 with a mouthpiece, and then the difference between the arterial and the mixed venous oxygen content uh, divide the VO2 by the difference between those two, uh, you have actually a sick cardiac output. It really is pulmonary blood flow, and in most cases, without any shunting of blood, abnormal shunting of blood, um, and I'll get into that in just a second, um, the pulmonary blood flow matches the systemic blood flow, and we can quantify it and determine every minute what that number is, and then at maximum exercise, what percent predicted it is. What we've discovered, in addition to the preload failure, that's the low filling pressures during upright exercise, and I'd emphasize upright. If you do this too fine on a cath lab table, you will miss the signal. Mm -hmm. uh, with gravity as the enemy, as it were, what we can elicit is these low filling pressures. We call that preload failure, so that's part of it. Mm -hmm. And the other part with uh, both ME and long COVID is uh, evidence, at least in a subset of patients, a very high pulmonary blood flow with evidence of low systemic blood flow. Now, that pattern has been known forever, both on the cardiac cath lab table, uh, but also um, in exercise testing uh, with intracardiac left to right shunting. So with a, with a septal defect in congenital heart disease, pressures tend to be higher, for instance, in the left atrium and blood, systemic blood, well oxygenated blood is pushed preferentially over to the right side and around and around in the lung circuit it goes. That's the definition of left to right shunting. Right. And we have found the very same phenomenon without any evidence of intracardiac left to right shunting in a subset of patients with MECFS, a paper published in Chess last summer with Philip Joseph as the first author. And then um, we have found the very same thing in um, long COVID. So it seems to be a dual abnormality of um, peripheral blood vessel tone mm -hmm. and blood flow uh, that underlies at least a fair amount of the exercise and tolerance. both diseases, on the venous side, it's failure to vein open. Um, and push the blood physically back up to the right atrium to failure to prime the pump as it were. We measure that with low filling pressures, both sides of the heart, but especially the right atrium. And then the additional problem in a subset of patients that seems to be more frequent in women than in men is something that we're um, investigating. Um, this left to right shunning that appears to be peripheral. We know that Mm -hmm. There's no intracardiac shunting based on the resting right heart catheterization and some oxygen measurements uh, done traditionally there. This all seems to be in the periphery. And the final part of this is that there is a, at least a loose association with uh, autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And in about 45% of ME patients with these vascular abnormalities, we can demonstrate with a skin biopsy that there is either definite or probable evidence with uh, nerve density or neurite density in the epidermis of the skin of something called small fiber neuropathy. Right. 
right. just briefly on that. Um, mm -hmm. The small fibers uh, have a lot of functions. They've been known forever that they mediate pain. So they're very much the same as the uh, pain fibers. They're unmyelinated small fibers uh, that are in multiple organs, but especially in the skin where we can sense pain. But um, more recently, uh, largely neurology has come to recognize that they play autonomic nervous system function as well, both mm. sympathetic and parasympathetic function. And what we think we're seeing in ME and in long COVID is this association between uh, the absence of the nerve fibers on a skin biopsy and then blood vessel dysregulation, both venous and arterial, uh, during upright exercise. And uh, at least the hypothesis is that uh, this is post-infection most often uh, in ME and of course all the time in long COVID, uh, post-infection, uh, likely autoimmune, dysautonomia or autonomic nervous system dysfunction, and in turn we get uh, abnormalities of blood vessel tone and blood, blood vessel flow, especially during upright exercise. So I know that's a mouthful, but uh, that's exactly what we have um, uh, found over the last several years. Wow, I think that is such an interesting finding, especially um, something that I'm that I'm curious about is how does post um, orthostatic intolerance play a role in this? Is this something that you see with these patients, or is this separate from MECFS? Do you think this has it, something it, to do? Yeah, it's very much related. Um, if uh, one drew a Venn diagram of these disorders, mm -hmm. um, there would be huge overlap amongst. Uh, ME, CFS, and um, POTS, for instance, and less frequently, frank orthostatic hypotension during an upright tilt table test. And um, so uh, we are in the process of trying to marry our exercise findings, both in the vascular dysregulation and also just parenthetically the hyperventilation that we see during exercise. To Dr. Peter Novak's findings at Brigham Faulkner, uh, who does the tilt table test and measures along the way in most patients uh, end tidal carbon dioxide uh, level uh, pressure, partial pressures, which go down in a subset of patients, meaning there's hyperventilation during upright tilt table test. Uh, and then he additionally measures brain blood flow with uh, transcranial Dopplers. And uh, so he can show in a subset of patients with chronic fatigue and more recently long COVID uh, that when he puts them in the upright position, yes, there are symptoms. There's the orthostatic intolerance. And uh, yes, there's hyperventilation just as during exercise. And additionally, he can show that brain blood flow, uh, perhaps read component of brain fog there, uh, is decreased in these patients during the upright tilt table. And um, a large percentage of them has uh, classic uh, criteria, meaning the heart rate changes or POTS, so postural uh, POTS, postural or static tachycardia syndrome. So large overlap, uh, not perfect. I think um, having done a lot or ordered or seen the results of uh, folks who've had previous silk table tests and then done our exercise tests, I think that we end up catching more pre-post failure, more evidence of dysautonomia with the exercise testing than the classic tilt table test mm. uh, diagnosis of pasta, uh, but there is substantial overlap. Thanks for explaining that a little bit. I always think that's interesting to see all the different pieces of the puzzle and how they interact with each other, um, because I know that's such a common comorbidity with many patients with MECFS and also now with long COVID. So something else that I just, that I think is a huge hindrance to research in general is obviously just, just funding into MECFS specifically. And which brings me to a question. So if money was no object, obviously it always is with this disease, what would you like to do towards finding a cure for MECFS and these related multi-system diseases? Yeah, I think, um, the two areas are 
the ones we touched on just briefly um, mm -hmm. earlier, and that is um, money spent to better define these diseases and better understand uh, the symptoms, uh, you know, that result in the clinical diagnosis or the case definition. So, um, and I think largely speaking, those categories uh, are the ones I mentioned. So, path the pathophysiology of exercise and illness because fatigue and post-exertional malaise is ubiquitous and orthostatic intolerance and exercise in the upright position is very, very common. Um, so, uh, the exercise testing, um, I think the, uh, with the invasive component to it uh, opens a lot of doors, sheds a lot of light on the pathophysiology. But maybe two comments on that. Um, one is it needs, we need to do more than just describe the pathophysiology. We need to uh, take perhaps those hemodynamic subsets that we've identified and then uh, design properly, properly design uh, clinical trials that address the problem. So for now, what we've been doing is we've been, um, and others have been borrowing some from the POS literature and uh, mm -hmm. drugs that have been found useful in osteoarthrostatic tachycardia syndrome and orthostatic hypotension and dysautonomia and using those drugs and then determining if it makes the patient better. So that's one approach using exercise and uh, borrowing from another area such as POT. Um, I think another area where um, in 2022 uh, money would be well spent is further um, exploring omics. So mm -hmm. that's um, plasma and even cold blood um, uh, signal signatures that might identify patients with ME and with long COVID and even better subsets of patients who have different signatures. So we've, we've begun to make some forays into this area actually with Ron Tompkins help in OMS. Uh, we have uh, data back and are writing up uh, four different papers. One is on the inflammasome and it's uh, special activation excessive activation as a result of acute exercise in ME and uh, hopefully going forward long COVID. Uh, so we have a, a multiplex that uh, we ran with the help of uh, NIH uh, in largely uh, so-called trail-related pathway uh, that is, represents the inflammasome and inflammatory cytokines that are uh, elicited by acute exercise. Um, and so that's one of the areas. And we have two different lines of evidence using proteomics and mm -hmm. uh, one line of evidence using metabolomics. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are others. There are transcriptomics and, and there are microvesicles we know in the blood and even some emerging evidence that the red blood cells in uh, both uh, ME and in um, long COVID are abnormal. Uh, they're uh, abnormally large, they're stiff, they may not get through capillary uh, normally, and their interactions with the endothelium of uh, both systemic blood vessel uh, may be abnormal. So this may be uh, one of the underlying reasons for abnormal oxygen extraction during uh, maximum exercise in both ME and long COVID. So lots of lines of evidence that are using either plasma or whole blood in its cellular elements um, to better understand some of the vascular dysregulation. Um, one other area I didn't mention uh, is uh, that there is a differential diagnosis for impaired oxygen extraction mm -hmm. uh, during exercise that we found with an invasive defect. Uh, one of them we've talked about, and that's the left to right shunning. Right. The other possibility is an intrinsic mitochondrial dysfunction in the limb skeletal muscle. And um, if, uh, yeah, if that can give the very same findings um, um, of impaired oxygen extraction um, uh, 
have left or right shunning. And this is a, a relatively uncharted territory for both ME and definitely for long COVID. Uh, but there is some evidence, little bits and pieces historically, uh, that, for instance, the virus um, can hijack the genetic material in the mitochondria and make it dysfunctional. Um, and then there's certainly some evidence that as a result of infection, either prior infection or latent infection that's reactivated and the resulting inflammation that the mitochondria um, suffer oxidant damage um, or oxidant stress and maybe the mitochondria becomes dysfunctional. So this is very different from the, not different, totally different, but a different genesis uh, than the genetic form of dysfunction. It's acquired, um, it's dysfunction, um, and, but it results in the very same uh, symptoms we think of fatigue, perhaps post-exertional malaise, and perhaps may even influence the autonomic neuropathy that we've been talking about because um, Peripheral nerves are high energy tissues. They re rely on adequate mitochondria. Same goes for, this is not about this. Uh, I'm not studying in particular, but uh, folks in the neurology ranks are. So, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is another area that I think mm -hmm. might beg for clinical trials because the treatment uh, available and mitochondrial dysfunction are totally different from the treatments that are usually directed at dysautonomia. I think that's such an important area of research, mitochondrial dysfunction, as well as it, your work is just so important because post-exertion malaise specifically is just a hallmark symptom of MECFS. And I know it's also found prominently in long COVID patients as well. It's something that we're hearing more and more about. So this work that you're doing to investigate this specific symptom, I think, is just is key to a lot of the heart of this disease. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I should probably mention we have um, completed one randomized clinical trial of a PONS drug, uh, as it were, in MECFS. Oh, wow. Uh, in a, and it's in, in press in uh, one of our cardiopulmonary journals called CHESS. Uh, so it will be the light of publication today very soon. Um, and it was a study of 50 patients with MECFS randomized uh, to placebo or uh, pyridostigmine, which is methadone. And this is an example of off-label use of uh, uh, what one could view as a POTS drug. Uh, the POTS doctors have used it forever. Um, it's a myasthenia gravis drug. It in improves the concentration of acetylcholine in the synapse between nerves and, and myasthenia between uh, the nerve and the motor end plate. And um, what we have found, what we found in the study was we basically uh, took MECFS patients at the case definition. Uh, they did a clinically indicated invasive CFAT, and then if they had evidence of the vascular dysregulation I mentioned on the first test, they were randomized to receive placebo or 60 milligrams of pyridostigmine, and then they were asked to cycle again approximately 15 minutes, five zero minutes uh, later uh, with the catheter still in place. And what we found was um, a evidence that with uh, mestinon, uh, the right atrial pressures were higher during the second test. Uh, the cardiac output was higher at peak exercise, and the VO2 peak was higher at peak exercise. That was the primary endpoint. Uh, and interestingly, if they received placebo, all those things were worse. So we think, um, you know, this was just a single acute dose of um, uh, 60 milligrams of mestinon. We don't clinically most patients who respond to mestinon with ME, CFS do so over weeks uh, to months even uh, at higher doses. But the biologic signal was there and it was statistically significant. So we think we had a window uh, into the pathophysiology of the disease and that um, kind of over
overriding um, abnormally low sympathetic tone by enhancing uh, the sympathetic tone through the, what's known to be a cholinergic stem, the sympathetic ganglion. Um, we think that we, what we did was tighten up the, the venoconstriction, improve preload, and therefore be able to peak with a single dose. So it's a proof of concept. The effect size was not great, but again, it was a single acute dose of, uh, of medicine. So uh, I'm unaware of anything quite like that in the field. Uh, we're excited about it. I think um, it, it at least helps um, uh, codify the notion that vascular dysregulation is at play in the MEC event and that it deserves diagnosis and treatment. Uh, the other um, perspective, uh, randomized uh, placebo controlled clinical trial we have ongoing is an $8 million study of mitochondrial dysfunction at the Brigham. It's a single site um, uh, study funded by a pharma company named Estellas from Japan. Uh, it is MECFS, but um, PASP was not excluded, so we have already included some patients in the study uh, who have long COVID. Yeah. And it involved um, two very difficult to get uh, needle muscle biopsies of the thigh frozen and sent appropriately to Baylor for evaluation of mitochondrial function. And I would emphasize we think that approach in ME and PASP is very important. Again, because most of these patients don't have genetic forms of mitochondrial myopathy. Um, and uh, it, the study's ongoing. Uh, it was powered with 40 patients, or zero. And we have uh, enrolled 27 of the 40 over about six months. And uh, we're looking to complete this and uh, run our stats on this. It involves two invasive PFETs that had. Um, baseline and then at the end of six weeks of treatment with a PPAR delta modifier. Uh, it's proprietary, but it's thought to, uh, generally speaking, act uh, favorably on fat metabolism by the mitochondria. And um, so we don't know what patients have gotten yet, uh, but stay tuned. Thank you so much for explaining that a little bit more. We'll be really interested to hear as research comes out and more um, information is gathered from the sample collection and from this data. Uh, we, we would agree. And I and of course, we are by no means um, the only one uh, in this field. And um, you know, a special shout out to others who have uh, been at it for a longer period of time than I. Um, Addressing uh, oh the the infectious uh, underpinnings of MECFS, um, the immunology, um, and uh, to a degree some of the things we've talked about. Uh, so uh, I've come a little more lately to to the party as it were. But I think we've got some tools that we found very useful in other diseases at our disposal, and again with a bit of serendipity been able to apply it to ME and to PASC, and I think um, we've got some insight. But, you know, you asked me earlier, uh, where would I love to see um, an infinite supply of uh, research funding go, and that would be to the, the folks across the country and really across the globe who have um, taken the diseases, uh, ME, CSS, and um, PASC. Seriously, who, um, who have addressed uh, these diseases with their own infrastructure and their own laboratory infrastructure. And I'm hoping that we can move this rapidly to better diagnostics and better therapeutics with the proper clinical trials. So it, it is going to take a village to better understand these diseases and to learn how to treat them properly. Um, and of course, I am very much aware, largely through Ron Tompkins' consortium, and a special uh, shout out to him. He's dearly missed and uh, really uh, did establish the notion of teamwork in this area. 
Uh, but what I've come to recognize is that both clinically and on a research basis, um, that we have to bring together really all the specialties and subspecialties of medicine. And um, I am continually impressed that there are areas of expertise uh, that come from the neurology ranks, the immunology ranks, infectious disease. Um, special shout out to Donna Felsenstein at Mass General um, and Peter Novak at Brigham Faulkner. Uh, rheumatology, pulmonary, cardiology, um, and we all really have to be talking to each other to uh, make progress. The silos should be broken down, and I think that was Dr. Tompkins' vision, yes. and uh, that's something that I hope that we can uh, carry forward. Absolutely, and I, we really appreciate you stepping in here to help carry out Dr. Tompkins' legacy because this, this meant so much to him to see that these patients were able to have improvements in their healthcare and in their lives overall. So thank you for joining our scientific Open Medicine Foundation's not only scientific advisory board, but stepping up to the role as director at the newly established, at the newly named Ronald G. Tompkins Harvard Collaborative. It just, it means a lot to these patients on a global scale, um, myself being one of them actually. And it's just, it, it really, it's, I know it's exactly what he would have wanted. Thank you.